Hello everyone, I hope you are all well and well fed, and if you are not, uh, it might be a good idea to grab something to eat before we start. I hope the lighting is okay, I, I can't open the, um, the curtains any more than this, because it's like 40 degrees Celsius outside, and if I let any more light in, this house will start looking like the waiting room of hell. This video is a continuation of my most recent release and although it can be watched independently, I advise you to check out the other one first because it will provide you with some context. Very briefly, we last time we talked about the Jomon period, the second period in the history of ancient Japan in very general terms. We saw who made the first discoveries, we uncovered the reason behind the name Jomon, we determined that the period is difficult to classify due to its special characteristics, we tackled the technological developments that the people of the time were using, among other things. My idea was also to talk about the Jomon settlements, the places where people lived, in the past video, but I didn't have the opportunity to do so, because I didn't want the video to be too long. Fortunately, addressing the topic in this video, which is going to be about food, is perfectly appropriate. Why, you ask? Because in order to discuss food, we have to understand how people obtained food in the first place, and that, in turn, is closely related to the way people at the time built their camps. Let's start precisely with that. An American archaeologist called Binford created a model in which there are two major subsistence systems, one in which populations are foragers and another in which the populations are collectors. According to Binford, the two systems are not opposite poles, but a continuum. When analyzing the subsistence system of various populations, it is unlikely we find one that is purely based on foraging or purely based on collecting. Most are somewhere on this continuum. Let's look at the differences between collectors and foragers. In an environment where the distribution of resources is homogeneous, hunter-gatherers tend to acquire food and other resources close to their own base. The area where these resources are acquired is called the foraging zone and has a radius of around 10 kilometers, or 2 hours of walking in a straight line. This is the forager's model. When resources run out in the foraging zone, the population moves its own base to a new location. Another characteristic of foraging is that there is no storage of food. Ethnographic data indicates that foragers move their home bases between 5 and 45 times a year. Compared to foragers, collectors are more sedentary. When the distribution of critical resources is spatially and or seasonally uneven, hunter-gatherers, in addition to daily foraging activities within the foraging zone, send specialized work parties to acquire resources located outside this zone. Food storage is an important part of the collector's subsistence strategy. Most collectors change their own bases only a few times a year. In this example, which uses data from the Nunamut in Alaska, the group forms a large residential base in Settlement 1 and stays there from fall to spring. At the beginning of the summer, they move the entire village to Settlement 2, because 2 is more convenient for summer subsistence activities than 1. At the end of the summer, the group disperses to smaller home bases. Most collectors change bases according to the seasons, but in some rare cases they can be completely sedentary, remaining in permanent residential bases all year round. This type of system only occurs when all the important seasonal resources are available in one place. This is the case of the Hainu in Hokkaido. Of course, you have to bear in mind that this Binford model is quite old, but it's also simple, uh, simple and intuitive and it will help me to explain the various phases of the Jomon period to you in a future video. Because yes, the Jomon period is made up of six different phases, and each of them can be placed at different points on this foraging collecting spectrum. In fact, even populations from the same period, but in different geographical locations, will show differences when it comes to their system of obtaining resources. Thus, in a given period, a camp to the north might be more towards one end of the spectrum than another camp further south. I hope this explanation has made sense to you. 
As for why there are such differences between the various phases of the Jomon era, that's a subject we will get to in due course. But in very simple terms, it's mainly due to the fact that this era is a very long one, more than 10,000 years, as you know. The type of resources available and their spatial distribution have changed greatly over time, forcing populations to alter their subsistence and settlement systems over and over again. Factors that don't have to do with the environment also certainly play a role. New technologies were developed, population density increased and decreased, the various communities began to exchange critical resources with one another and so on. And of all the factors, there is one in particular that generates a lot of doubt and controversy. The cultivation of plants by the Jomon. But wait, you say. Didn't you say the Jomon didn't farm? Patience, we will get to that in a moment. No, they didn't practice agriculture, but a kind of horticulture. This becomes quite clear when we analyze certain remains. But the truth is that we don't know how important this practice was for the Jomon, that is, how much their diet depended on the plants they cultivated. A complement? Something significant enough to change their settlement patterns? We will discuss this later. Anyway, I want you to keep this idea of the models in mind. I thought for this video all that's important to know is that both the location and the, of the camps and the organization of the various areas within the camp is closely linked to obtaining resources. It seems obvious, but it's important to stress. Of all these resources, we are going to highlight food, the main subject of today's video. Jomon ruins have been found at around 90,000 locations. Just like the Jomon period, the evolution of the camps can also be divided into phases. Something that academics are certain of is that the Jomon people managed to establish stable, semi-permanent settlements very early on around 13,500 years ago, which coincides with a phase known as incipient Jomon, the first of all. Some would even say that 13,500 years ago, we were still at the end of the Paleolithic. The Shojiyama Winter Camp in the south of Kagoshima Prefecture on the island of Kyushu and the Kakoi Noara Summer Camp are considered to be the first settlements. The emergence of the camps coincides with the development of the use of ceramics. In the beginning, these camps consisted of a single living area, with a circular shape. An example of this type of camp is the Odai Yamamoto site, located on the banks of a river. At this stage, the global temperature was still cold, but the glacial period was already over. On this page, you can see how small the site is. And it is where the artifacts were unhurted. The archaeological site even has a mascot, called Mumo, whose name derives from Mumon Doki, and decorated pottery. What happened next was the addition of a grave site. The camps now have two, have two areas, the residential area and the grave. An example of this type of camp is the Kakinoshima site, located in a coastal area. With the increase in temperature, the sea level rose, which allowed for more in-depth exploration of marine resources. Once again, here is the camp, as well as what is believed to be a shared grave. From this grave, 10 clay tablets with footprints, possibly funerary objects, were unhurted. This archaeological site is also associated with a mascot, the Dogo Director which who is the mascot of all the archaeological sites in the Akodate region. The Dogo are ceramic figures that are an integral part of the Jomon culture. We will talk about them in a future video. As time progressed, the camps became more and more complex. In addition to the residential and burial areas, there were also places for storing food, for storing goods and dumping sites. Examples of such camps include the Kitakogaine site by the sea, the Tagoyano site, which is located near a bay, and the Futatsumori site, which is located by a lake. You can even see reconstructions of houses in this camp. Note how they are a bit squared shaped. This is characteristic of the evolution of Jomon houses. Older houses tended to be conical and have circular floors. The houses built later had square or rectangular, or rectangular floors with rounded corners. It was during this time that a large number of eruptions took place, 
something that has already been covered in the past video. The consequences of these eruptions will be mentioned again. After these incidents, the climate st stabilized and allowed us to enter the Middle Jomon phase. One of the characteristics of the settlements from this period is that they tend to have a central littoral area that is clearly visible. This phase has left behind some of the most impressive camps, such as the oft-mentioned Sanai Maruyama, built in a bay area, or Fune, a coastal village, and Goshono, built by a river. These large Jomon villages in particular fascinate scientists because they go against the theory that settlements are only able to grow with the help of agriculture and livestock. Such a level of development without one or the other is unusual. Still on the subject of Sanai Mayuriyama camp, a few more details should be mentioned because this is the most famous Jomon era archaeological site in all of Japan and it even features a unique structure known as the Six Pillar Structure. The purpose of this structure is unclear. Some speculate that it, it used to be a watchtower, while others think that people use it for religious purposes. Sanai Maruyama dates back between 5,500 and 4,000 years, and has an impressive number of dwellings, 700, as well as long houses with thatched roofs, elevated buildings, graves, burial, jars, and stone circles. People had known about the site since the Edo period, because fragments of pottery and dogu statues would be found there from time to time, but it wasn't until 1994 that the site gained international fame. During a survey for the construction of a baseball stadium, six large fragments of Cessna trunks were found in the area. This led the researchers to wonder if these were the remains of pilers. The site could be a huge ancient settlement. Upon realizing the significance of this discovery, the provincial government decided to suspend construction of the stadium and began a full-scale investigation. And that's why the archaeological site of Sanai Maruyama exists today. As mentioned in the previous video, it is thought that Sanai Maruyama was a seasonal camp, meaning that it was not occupied all year round. Based on the many precious objects that have been found at the site, such as lacquered objects and jade and amber ornaments, it is believable that Sanai Maruyama was a major trading center. Its very location at the tip of Aomori Bay favors this theory, as it would even allow travelers from overseas to come and trade. From the middle Jomon onwards, population density began to fall dramatically, thought to be due to the cooling climate which resulted in the camps becoming smaller and more dispersed. Ceremonial areas, which included a cemetery, were built outside the camps. Characteristic archaeological sites from this period include Iri, a coastal village, and the stone circles of Kamo Komakino, Ize Dotai, and Hoyu. Finally, the ceremonial areas and the cemeteries were separated. Both remained outside the camps. The burial sites of Kyuzu in the hills, Takazago by the sea and Kamegawaka near a bay, as well as the Omori Katsuyama Stone Circle and the Korekawa Camp all come from this period. Now that we know how camps evolved over time, let's go inside and look at the details. The typical Jomon house was built in a pit, and for that reason it was called a pit house. The average depth of this pit was 60 to 70 centimeters, but in Hokkaido they could be as deep as 2 meters and a half, because Hokkaido is the northernmost region and therefore the coldest. The deeper the house, the more sheltered it would be. Holes were then dug inside the pit, so that wood pilers could be set up. All these pillars, in turn, supported roofs. Kaya straw, miscanthus, was often used to cover the roofs because it helped drain rainwater into the surrounding ditches. In fact, the whole house, except for the entrance, was usually covered with leaves, branches or bark. The floor was sometimes paved with stones and its average surface area was 20 to 30 square meters. It was common to have an indoor fireplace in the center of the house. 
Digging up the soil, cutting down trees and extracting roots was hard work, and several of the skeletons found in the shell mounds dating back to the Middle Jomon phase reveal a high percentage of fractures, particularly in the right forearm, and especially among the male population. The skeletons found at Ubayama in Shiba Prefecture suggest that the house was occupied by an average of five inhabitants, and analysis of the ceramics indicates that a village was generally made up of five or six houses, in other words, a total of 25 to 30 people. In more advanced camps, there were, some, there were storage pits and ditches for producing smoked food. In addition to dwellings, the Jomon also built elevated structures, which rested on pillars and whose floors did not touch the ground. In the Yayoi period, which followed the Jomon period, these were used to store rice. But during the Jomon period, it is thought that they served to protect food from humidity or as temples where rituals were performed on special occasions, or both. Long houses were built in the largest settlements of the Jomon era. A long house could fit three fireplaces. In many of the villages, especially during the middle and late periods, the Jomon people built ritualistic zones consisting of paved areas and stone circles featuring law, vertical stone monuments. Some of these monuments seem to be aligned with certain celestial bodies. As for where people defecated, the answer is in shell mounds. The shell mounds were located outside the residential areas, within walking distance. These places are called kaizuka in Japanese. Kaizuka is basically a place where people throw away garbage and things they no longer need. By throwing the cells into a pit, the Jomon managed to get the calcium in them to seep into the soil and make it alkaline, which hinders the decomposition process. The calcium also seeped into the excrements, making them hard as stone. In short, the Jomon came up with a very hygienic solution to the human waste problem. Storage pits are a common element in Jomon settlements, and most of them were used to store supplies of nuts, so researchers believe that this type of food played a very important role in the survival of the Jomon, just as it was equally important to, for Paleolithic people. In Western Japan, wet storage pits were common, lined with layers of leaves, wood fragments and clay. In Eastern Japan, on the other hand, dry storage pits, often in the shape of a jar, were more popular. No food remains have been recovered from these pits, so scholars assume that the food was first placed in containers, jars or baskets, and only then stored in the holes. The oldest storage pit dates back to the early Jomon period, 11,300 years ago, and was found at the Gashi Kurotsu Shida archaeological site in Kagoshima Prefecture. Large quantities of konara acorns were found inside. To be eaten, these acorns have to be soaked and then boiled. This is the only way to remove the tannic acid, which is very bitter. So even in the incipient Jomon phase, the Jomon already knew about this process of removing tannic acid. The Jomon people were adept at exploiting their ecosystems and managing their food resources sustainably. As in the Paleolithic era, the seasons mark what had to be done. Hunting predominated in late fall and winter, harvesting in spring and early fall, and fishing in summer. Excavation suggests the consumption of more than 60 species of mammals, including not only deer and wild boar, but also monkeys and tanuki, 55 types of plants, 35 species of birds, and more than 420 species of marine life. According to a group of anthropologists from Niigata, it is estimated that 1 to 3% of ancient hunters worldwide suffered from significant tooth decay, but the rate of tooth decay among the Jomon people was much higher, at 80%. This indicates that the Jomon diet was rich, was rich in starch, which can cause tooth decay. The team analyzed the teeth of around 270 people from the Jomon period, between 10,000 BC and 400 BC, and found that the demographic group most affected were women over the age of 40, which, according to the researchers, might indicate that women were more likely to eat sweet snacks. When you consider how important nuts were to the Jomon diet, this is hardly surprising. The Jomon had mastered the techniques for removing tannic acid from nuts, and, as a, and just as they were able to eat the nuts on their own, 
They could also turn them into powder using mortars and pestles to obtain a dough that could be then converted into bread, cookies or dumplings. In fact, it is thought that one of the Jomon's main meals consisted of a plate of acorn floor dumplings which were cooked in a soup of herbs and roots flavored with salt. From the remains of food found in the ceramic pots, it is possible to see that the cook spent a lot of time finally chopping the herbs and roots on a flat stone and that he or she cooked the ingredients very slowly. Another popular food was cookies made from seasonal ingredients, such as pounded nuts, minced meat, egg, salt and water. The Jomon cookie was rich in nutrients. At the Ondashi archaeological site in Yamagata prefecture, a cookie was found with beautiful patterns applied to the surface. The, cookies were, the cookie was made from cyst nuts, walnut floor, meat and blood from wild boar and deer, and eggs from wild birds. Egoma oil might have been used to coat or flavor the cookies. It is believed that the Jomon people must have dried or smoked a lot of meat, fish and shellfish, and perhaps whale and marine mammal meat in certain coastal areas, both for storage and for trade. At the beginning of the Jomon era, some of the tribes already knew how to ferment and prepare fruit wine from elderberries, blackberries and wild grapes. In Kitakanbara, Kurokawa, Niigata Prefecture, a black wooden jar was found that contained a large quantity of elderberries. The jar was lacquered and had sculpted patterns, so it is possible that it was used in some kind of religious ceremony. Many communities also relied on dogs for hunting, and there is no evidence that these communities fed on them. Dog meat only began to be consumed in the Yayoi period. The climate changes that occurred after the end of the Ice Age greatly affected the flora and fauna ecosystems. As far as flora is concerned, coniferous forests, common in the cold zone, were pushed further north and broadleaf deciduous forests, made of oaks, beeches and elms, expanded. Communities that didn't have access to this type of trees in the Paleolithic period were able to feast on acorns, shinko beans, cestnuts, Japanese or cestnuts, walnuts and various wild mountain vegetables. It is thought that the people of the time also ate mushrooms, potatoes and various roots. Japanese or chestnuts were gathered in September and acorns in October and November. Fruits that the Jomon could get their hands on included wild grapes, mountain peaches and akebi, a vine that produces a fruit similar to a pomegranate. Berries, parsley, ferns and butterbur, which served as a condiment, were collected. Stars was obtained from lily bulbs and tubers, ground and pound into wicker trays, which were then placed on the rims of pots to be steamed and turned into a kind of cake or bread. Small shared fragments of bread have been found in Odojiri, Nagano and Okinawara. Some researchers argue that the Jomon people were not very different from modern people who live in residential areas and commute to the city for work every day. Similarly, the Jomon people moved daily from their residential villages to various locations where they performed their respective functions, such as hunting, fishing and gathering plants, nuts, shellfish and raw materials. These resource sites were well known, being visited on purpose over and over again, and information about their existence was passed down from generation to generation. The Jomon in charge of harvesting vegetables, nuts and acorns were those who traveled the shortest distances. The gathering was done with it within a radius of 2 kilometers, so they didn't stray too far from the settlements. The Jomon had an in-depth knowledge of the sea, from the near shore to the straits, and knew how to use rivers to their full potential. As well as har harvesting shellfish from the sea and the river, the people fished using canoes. The hooks and harpoons heads recovered suggest that relatively large fish were, were caught with line and spear and that smaller fish were caught with fishing nets. It is thought that stones were used as weights to, to sink the nets, but net sinkers made of bone were also found. As with hunting, traps were also used for fishing. At an archaeological site in Ichikari, Hokkaido, 17 fishing traps wares, were found that are believed to have been placed in the river around 4,000 years ago. In the Kazori shell mound, which consists of 2 meters of accumulated shells, making it the largest shell mound in all of Japan, 68 different species of shells have been found. Around 90% of the mound, however, is dominated by the remains of Ibokizago, a sea snail 
that was apparently the staple of people's seafood diets in Shiba during the Jomon period. Orient clams were the second most popular, followed by Japanese cockle and surf clam. It is thought that Ibo Kizago was used to make broth, to make food taste better. Many canoes dating back to the early Jomon era have been found. These canoes were used for deep sea fishing. Thus, the Jomon people not only caught fish such as black snapper, red snapper, Japanese sea bass and flatfishes, but also larger fish, such as, such as tuna and salmon. Especially in northern Japan, fish that live in deep waters, such as tuna, bonito, salmon or trout, were important food resources for the Jomon people. Other species of fish caught include eel, the Japanese flounder, seepers, red sea bream, black porgy, herring, scorpion fish, mullet, bar-tailed flathead, brutal moray, opal eye, mackerel, or mackerel, parrot fish, and shark. Marine mammals, such as whales, dolphins, and others, were very important resources for certain coastal communities. These communities developed advanced fishing techniques and tools. At the Mawaki archaeological site in Ishikawa Prefecture, for example, which is located at the entrance to Toyama Bay, dolphin remains have been found, 286 of them from the Jomon period. In fact, these remains make up 90% of the remains found at the site. Mawaki was therefore a place where the Jomon slaughtered dolphins. Studies carried out at, an, at other disposal sites, the Ajashi Cell Mound in Toyama Prefecture, the Natagiri Cave in Shiba Prefecture and the Iris Shell Mound in Hokkaido revealed that between 7 and 21 dolphins were captured on each expedition. It is thought that dolphin meat was sometimes dried or smoked so that it could be shared with neighboring villages and sold over a wide area. Fishing for marine mammals was not an easy task. It required a great deal of skill, entailed risks and required an in-depth knowledge of the animal's behavior. Dolphins are very, uh, are very agile, intelligent animals, capable of working in groups to escape capture. Nets were useless in these cases. They had to be hunted using spears and harpoons. The same logic applies to whales. The kit for hunting marine mammals would therefore include spearheads and arrowheads made of stone, hooks, harpoons, line, spears, nets, pumice floats, stone sinkers, needles made of deer antler bone, and knives for cutting ropes and processing catches. The toggle added harpoon in particular was considered cutting edge technology. When the harpoon hit a whale or other target, the shaft dropped and the harpoon head rotated sideways. The line and the float remained attached to the harpoon. In the sideways position, the tip of the harpoon was less likely to move when the wounded whale tried to escape. The most curious thing of all is that this prehistoric method and equipment from a certain point of view can be considered superior to modern methods and equipment for hunting whales. This is because the target evasion rate is much lower. In other words, a whale was less likely to get loose from a Jomon harpoon than from a modern catching device. Therefore, from this point of view and without taking into account other factors such as time or personal risk, the harpoon with an articulated head resulted in a higher success rate. This harpoon is considered one of the most impressive technological innovations in human history. As already mentioned, due to the gradual disappearance of large prey, such as mammoths, elephants and others, the Jomon population began to turn their attention to small and medium-sized animals, namely wild boar, deer and hares. The bones of deer, bear, rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, pheasants and ducks are among the remains found in archaeological sites, so we know that these animals were part of the Jomon diet. Several traps and snares have also been discovered. In addition to traps, the Jomon used bow and arrows and stone-tipped spears for hunting. Cell and obsidian were the preferred materials for making the points, because they produced a very sharp blade. Dogs were also strong allies. More than 10,000 pit traps have been found by archaeologists in the Jomon settlements of the Tame Hills region, on the outskirts of Tokyo. The people of the time dug these pits and memorized their locations so that they could use them several times over the course of years. The pits were generally laid out in a linear fashion and flanked by posts and fences. Dogs were then used to drive wild animals directly into the pits. Although this type of trap was common at the beginning of the German period, the practice fell into disuse over the millennium. 
and like gators, whose work area involved a radius of 2 km, hunters were sent much farther ahead, having to cover distances ranging from 2 to 50 km. For this purpose, since these expeditions were not often carried out in one day, satellite camps were set up at various distances from the base camp. When we think about the Jomon diet, it's important to remember that Japan is a place with a lot of climatic variation. The environment in Hokkaido has almost nothing in common with that of the islands to the south of the archipelago. So the people living at opposite ends of the archipelago will be eating very different meals from each other. Let's do an exercise. I'm going to show you two meals, meals, meals in quotes because no one will be eating that much in one go, and you're going to try to guess which would be eaten in a more southerly region and which would be eaten in a more northerly region. In this first sample we have arguta wine, cod soup with seaweed, various seafood delicacies like crabs, oysters, abalones and scallops, dried salmon, lily starch dumpling with salmon caviar, seal stick with walnut cookies and walnuts and acorns. In this second sample we have clam and wild vegetable soup, turtle soup, shellfish and turtle eggs, roasted turbo marmoratus, sliced raw parrotfish, boiled palm crab, boiled wild boar meat, grilled snapperfish and stripped surgeon fish, boiled taro and acorn dumpling, acorns and stone pine wine. So which of these meals will be eaten on the southern Wikyu Okinawan islands? If you answer the second, you guessed right. The first clearly belongs to a northern region, and you can understand this thanks to foods such as salmon or seal. The southern meal, on the other hand, contains turtles and parrotfish, among other foods that you wouldn't be able to get in the north. If you want to know more about the differences between the foods you could get at one end of the Japan versus the other, you can check out a link I will leave in the description, which contains a database comparing archaeobotanical and archaeozoological records from two regions in opposite places, the northernmost prefecture of Hokkaido and the southernmost island chain of Ryukyu. I will show you two more examples of meals. This one is based on the archaeological site of Uenohara in Kagoshima and consists of seafood soup, grilled sea bream, which is called Thai in Japanese, and jamon cookies, made with nut flour. And this one is based on the Torihama Shell Mound in Fukui Prefecture and consists of wild boar soup with arcorn dumplings, fried smoked bear with lily bulb and roast venison shank. Even in the same region, the type of food eaten depended on the specific ecosystem surrounding the settlements. One last source of nutrition remains to be discussed. It used to be thought that the Jomon people did not cultivate plants, given that they are hunter-gatherers and that tools for large-scale agriculture activities, cycles, wrecks, etc. were only found in the subsequent Yoyoi period. However, more and more discoveries at archaeological sites suggests that the Jomoni practice horticulture, or gardening on a small scale. As hunter-gatherers, the Jomoni people were already adept at living off plant, of the plants and trees that grew naturally in the swamps and forests around them. It is possible that over time, they learned to plant seeds and transplant seedlings and shoots to locations closer to their settlements, as well as techniques to help them grow. Many scholars believe that these cultivated foods were only used to supplement the Jomon diet. Other experts believe that only a few communities practiced this primitive agriculture, particularly when the place where they lived was suitable for it. So let's look at some evidence. It is known, for example, that the Jomon community must have transplanted cistnut saplings from lower areas to the southern slopes of Mount Yatsugatake, where they lived. The sizes of some of the grains found in camps namely beans and nuts, tend to be larger than those of grains found in the wild, which implies some genetic selection. Based on the study of pollen, seeds and grains found in archaeological sites in the early and middle phases of the Jomon period, it is thought that the Jomon, in addition to maintaining and tending nut orchards, cultivated the following plants. Bohemeria nettle, hemp, egoma, shizomint, 
bottle gourd, buckwheat, barley, barnyard millet, beans, green grass, soybeans and burdock. In addition, seven grains of rice were recovered from the Kaza Ari archaeological site in Aomori prefecture, which dates back to the late Jomon. The Jomon culture is often compared with the pre-Columbian cultures of the Pacific Northwest of North America, and especially with the Valdivia culture in Equator, which also developed in a hunting gathering context and in which people practice horticulture. In any case, current data makes it practically impossible to deny the existence of some activities related to plant cultivation. However, this practice was not sufficiently organized to form the basis of the Jomon economy, and as such, is still not considered agriculture. As we saw in the mythology videos, the peach is a very important fruit for the Japanese. It was this fruit that helped Izanagi escape from Yomi, the world of the dead, and it was blessed as a result. It is possible that the peach was domesticated in Japan during the Jomon period. Bits of a domesticated variety of peach have turned up in strata dating back to 4,400 4, BC at the Kiriki archaeological site in Kyushu. It is thought that this type of domesticated peach arrived in Japan from China. The only other peach stones from the Jomon period were discovered at Nabataki, also in Kyushu, but this archaeological site dates back to the late Jomon. As you can see, the Jomon diet was quite different from the diet that characterizes Japan today. However, some influence remained. The mountainous region of Nagano lacks suitable land for growing rice, so there is a tendency towards a floor-based cuisine. Oyaki dumplings are a typical dish of the region. The, these dumplings are seasoned with miso and soy sauce, filled with seasonal vegetables and steam or grilled. One specialty, the Oyaki Jomon, pays homage to the ancient peoples. These oyaki are grilled over the embers of an Irori fireplace. And that concludes the video. Something I would have liked to have done, and perhaps will still do, is to recreate a Jomon meal, but there are some obstacles that make it difficult to carry out this project. So, do you see this spinning globe? Japan is here. And you know where I am? Literally on the other side of the globe. So I can just go to the supermarket and impulsively buy ingredients. The species that exist here are completely different. Ordering ingredients on the other hand is extremely, extremely expensive, not to mention that it will be impossible to get anything fresh. So I would have to be very careful and choose only ingredients that are common to both countries. So to create a German meal, I would have to find out what ingredients I can get in my region, find non-modern alternatives for cooking those ingredients, and create or significantly alter existing recipes. If I do end up creating some jamon treats, I will release a short video to show you. If not, let's, let's just pretend I didn't say any of this. Until next time and stay well.